This next portion of the Oregon Coast Show brought to you by Cylinder Inflatable Boats, leading the industry for over 25 years with the finest inflatable products. Why wait for the fish to bite when you can swim down after them? Instead of a pole, divers like Kim Johns use spears. As you'll see in this edition of Diving Oregon, the coast is a rich hunting ground. Well, for an adventurous time today, we've invited Steve Satterland, Oregon's last three-time spearfishing champion, who's also represented Oregon in the National Spearfishing Champions back in 1980. And Steve, to get that good at spearfishing has taken quite a long time. How long have you been spearfishing? Well, I've been at this for 26 years now, Kim. You've been diving in uh, Oregon for a long time, Steve. How would you compare Oregon spearfishing to uh, spearfishing in other plus spots in the Northwest here? Well, I've been diving all up and down the West Coast, and I honestly feel that Oregon has some of the best fishing that there is to be found. One of the reasons is uh, the uh, lack of pressure from divers. Uh, people normally don't go out and dive this kind of water. Well, spear fishing out here at Pacific City is pretty demanding. What kind of weapons do you use out here to get uh, the fish? Oh, we've got two different types here. This here is a this is a pole spear. Commonly, some people call it a hand spear. What you do is you grab the back here, you slide your hand up the shaft, and when you release it, then the spear flies out of your hand. This is the, one of the more popular weapons. Now this here is a band-loaded spear gun. This one here, you pull the bands back, cock it back here in the shaft. As you can see, this here gun, I have a light mounted on the muzzle. That's for getting in. It's pretty dark once you get down about 50 feet or so. Looking back in the holes, you need a light to see back in there, and that's usually where your lingcod are. Rockfish and whatnot, they're, they're free swimming, so you don't have, uh, pole spear is a little better for those. This here is also very popular, but these are real dangerous. Uh, these have been known to go off accidentally and uh, jam into people's legs and things like that, so uh, you got to be real careful with one of these. What kind of regulations govern spear fishing here in Oregon? Well, number one is you have to have a fishing license. You're only allowed three ling cod and 15 rockfish. You can have 25 in aggregate. Of course, uh, normally I only take one. That's all that'll fit in my pan. Well, Steve, what do you have in mind for us today? Today we're gonna go, uh, uh, it's about a half a mile out past the rock to a place uh, some of us old spear fishermen have called the Pinnacle for years and years. I keep a notebook here of all these places that I've been and uh, I make up these little elaborate notes on uh, how to get there, the shore bearings and whatnot. It's a pretty uh, detailed notebook you got there. Why do you keep such accurate records? Well, when one dives so many places, uh, you tend to forget these little spots. And uh, quite often, it'll be a pinnacle that comes up out of deep water, and it's very hard to find. You need a depth finder, depending on the the uh, fluctuations and the rise and fall of the tides can uh, put you one way uh, or another off the place you're seeking a uh, considerable distance. So I map out everything. Once we get where we are, normally we uh, drop a buoy, then we run the boat around the buoy and we find distinct objects on the shore to triangulate upon so that when we go out the next time we set up our shore triangulations and get out the depth finder and chug around in that area till we find the spot we're looking for you here you probably can't see it is the restaurant up in the parking lot exposed on the left hand side of the handle over here on the right hand side of the rock there's a little saddle and directly above that is the Hebo, Hebo uh, radar station up above. Also, there's some uh, stand of fir trees up above here, too, that normally you can see that you line up with a telephone pole on the beach. Nonetheless, with these lineups, it's still difficult to find because it's a very small area. This is how the pinnacle looks underwater. It's, the top of it up here is quite small. It's probably about uh, 50 yards in diameter. The shallowest depth on this is about 28 feet. The bottom here is 100 feet deep. Out on the northern end, there's a giant arch. You could drive a dump truck through it. It's about 95 feet deep. You can swim all the way through this thing. It's about 50 feet long. 
down in this area here, we have a lot of rubble and boulders where there's uh, large lingcod swimming around. And that's the favorite place we like to go. The first step in finding the pinnacle is getting out through the surf. The winter breakers off Cape Kowanda can be tricky if you get caught in the wrong place at the wrong time, especially with the boatload of gear. Once we've battled the smokers, it's up to Steve to locate the right spot. By using a depth finder and triangulating off his special markers, he puts us right over the reef. And with rich fishing grounds below, it's time to go hunting. One of the best things about diving after fish is the scenery. Few people get to see Haystack Rock from 100 feet beneath the ocean surface. It's a magic world, and as Steve points out, there's a lot more to the sport than just the thrill of the hunt. It's always exciting. It's always exciting. You see something different every time. There's a wide variety of uh, marine life out there. Sometimes whales swim by you. Uh, we see sharks. Uh, there's everything out there. The pinnacle is thick with fish. When the visibility is good, and they can see that a diver is definitely not a sea lion, the fish are more curious than frightened, unfortunately for them. The pole spear makes quick work out of catching fish. We string the catches on a line and let them tow behind. Luckily, Oregon waters don't have a problem with sharks, but a hungry sea lion won't think twice about stealing an easy meal. Fortunately, today, they're all up basking in the sun. These rockfish are easy to hunt down, but the big ling are another story. Here's the big crevice at the base of the pinnacle that Steve calls the ling crack. This is where the monsters like to sit and wait for an unlucky rockfish to swim too close. Using a pole spear to bring out a big ling is a challenge. Watch the end of the spear and you can see just how powerful these fish are. If you don't get a good shot off the first try, it can turn into a wrestling match and a mad ling has sharp teeth. With the fish so plentiful, it's easy to get carried away. But there's no sense in slaughtering the life on the reef just for sport. Although you're allowed three ling cod, one or two is plenty. And since we've reached our limit of fish before reaching our limit of air, it's time to head up to the surface and back to the beach. some black rock fish and we've got some lingcod. Now this is the best size for eating. Size that runs about 10 to say 20 pounds. Usually anything bigger than that's a female. We don't want to shoot any females this time of year as they're laying on eggs. Now I prefer these here. These are real fine eating fish. I, I consider them a delicacy. <laughs> Jim, he kind of likes these black rock fish. He has a special way he fixes them all up and uh, quite tasty. Well, Steve, uh, that was a pretty good job. Let's uh, fillet these babies up and go have some lunch, and we'll get out of here. What do you think? Sounds good. We'll start. Okay, for the Oregon Coast Show at Pacific City, I'm Kim Johns.